Welcome to Calvary Chapel. Great to see you guys. So glad you're here. Uh, before we get into Bible study, I want to take a moment to pray for all those in Afghanistan. As you know, we have a very serious situation over there. They're expecting possibly another, uh, at least an attempt at an attack or whatever before they're done. We've got our servicemen and women over there left. We have many Americans over there. Uh, we have uh, fellow brothers and sisters that are Afghan that are over there and pastors that are in there, Afghani pastors. And so I think it'd be good just to start this out and uh, just pray for God to really protect them. And then we'll get into the word today. But let's just pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the men and women that are serving in our armed forces. And um, God, our, I just pray your blessing and your um, uh, encouragement and your strength on the family we have here in town that even lost a, a son who was a Marine uh, just a few days ago. Lord, we can only imagine what that would be like. Uh, certainly there's a sense of honor that your child was serving, but Lord, that's still your child. And the heart is broken and the sorrow is real. And I pray not only for his family, but for all the families that lost someone they loved dearly just a few days ago. And I pray God now that you keep, put a supernatural protection around our men and women that are there serving. I can only imagine the thoughts running through their mind as they're standing around the crowds and guarding areas. Um, Lord, guard them mentally, guard them spiritually, guard them physically. Keep them safe and bring them home safely. All of our uh, uh, servicemen and women that are there, commanders and everyone. God, I pray for those that, Americans that are still there trying to get out. I think of these families, I know four families that uh, I know of that are connected to this area. God, get them out of there and uh, their wives and their kids. Uh, we pray, God, for any other Americans that need to get out, uh, for any of the believers that need to get out, and maybe, Lord, even some of the Afghan believers that can get out if they know their life is going to be taken. Pray your protection on the pastors over there. Keep them bold and courageous. And Lord, we know that even though this is ugly, uh, you are in control ultimately, and we know you're going to use it all for your glory. So Lord, have mercy uh, on them and all of us in light of this. And Lord, now as we get into your word today, and God, we continue looking at um, dealing with the demonic realm. Lord, uh, we see what's going on in Afghanistan. No doubt it's very demonic in many ways. And so we see those kind of things around the world. We know we're going to see more and more of the demonic realm here in our own nation, uh, in our own city, probably as time goes on, your word tells us in the last days, there's going to be more demonic activity. Lord, we need to understand it. We need to recognize it. We also need to know how to deal with it. And I pray you'd open your word to us this morning that you would teach us these things. Let this be very instructional. But at the same time, Lord, most of all, we want fellowship with you. Lord, we just want to be with you. So pour out your spirit on your people, Lord. Make yourself known. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, open them up to Matthew chapter 8, as we are going to be going through verses 28 through 34 this morning, and we are looking at dealing with the demonic. Now, remember last week, we looked at recognizing the, the demonic, and the week before that, this whole chapter started just looking at miracles. Chapter 8 is miracles. Uh, then we got into the demonic side of the miracles, where God was, uh, Satan was uh, trying to stop Jesus and his work and, and the disciples, and we saw Jesus do miracles in recognizing the demonic attack. We talked about that last week. Now, this week, we finished up the chapter looking at dealing with the demonic. You know, if, if you recognize the demonic, but you don't know how to deal with it, what good does it do, right? You've got to know how to deal with the demonic. And so we want to learn to uh, some techniques on how to deal with it. We'll see the Lord uh, gave us a few, and they're very effective. There's not that many actually needed if you're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. But the first thing we need to understand is the Bible declares we have authority over the demonic realm through Jesus. And you need to recognize that. You need to recognize, recognize that. I'll get the word out in a moment. You have authority over the demonic realm. That is something God has given you. And again, how you deal with that is, is um, recognizing it first and then taking action uh, to deal with it. I think first, one of the first things we have to do when it comes to dealing with the demonic realm is, first of all, recognize we have the authority, but number two, we have to deal with the fear factor that comes with it. I mean, let's all admit it, unless you've been walking with the Lord some length of time, or maybe you've been in the mission field and you've seen the demonic realm and gotten used to it to a certain degree, it can be rather intimidating. I mean, you can mention something about the demonic realm and it kind of freak you out if you don't understand. Sometimes people will call me and they'll say, Pastor Mark, we have something, I think, demonic going on in our home and we need you to come over and pray. And I'm thinking, you pray, I'm staying here, you know, but I don't know, no, no. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm, I mean, obviously, I'm their pastor. I'm going to go do that. But I, I don't go into that with fear because I go in there knowing this. Look, we have the authority over the demonic realm. And if anybody's afraid, it's the enemy that's afraid. 
But we have to recognize that the fear is unfounded for a number of reasons. Number one, understand who the enemy is. Who's the enemy? It is the fallen angels. One third of the angels that fell. They've already been defeated. They've been kicked out of heaven. Jesus created them. And now they're thrown out of heaven. They're done with. Number two, he said, I'll give you authority as my disciples over them. And we also know that they can't do anything to us that God doesn't allow. There is oftentimes demonic interaction in a believer's life. We know you can't be possessed. We talked about that last week because Satan cannot kick Jesus out of his home. But you can be oppressed, uh, again, where the enemy messes with us. And so we know the demonic realm has, has limited ways to deal with us there and to mess with us in our, in our heart and our mind. But God allows that for his reasons. It might be to grow us. It might be to correct us if we're veering off course. And it might be to teach us warfare. You know, we need to understand spiritual warfare. I remember when I first came to the Lord, uh, being a baby Christian, I was praying one time and I was praying in our church that we were attending, that I was attending at that time. Tracy and I weren't married. And I was in this room. Why in the world I was in there with the lights off? I don't know. It was was at night and the pastor knew me and he let me go in there and pray. And so I was in there praying. And all of a sudden this, I mean, I could feel the presence in the room. It was demonic. It wasn't God. It was something that wasn't good. And, And it was quite scary, quite honestly. I'd never dealt with something like that in that kind of capacity. And so through that, I began to pray, and, and there was a whole process there. Without going into long detail about that, I realized that one of the first things we have to overcome is the fear factor. And if you can recognize who you're fighting and realize you have authority over them and pray against them, then you can have victory in that. And they're the ones that are intimidated by us. Remember, they're, they're the fallen angels. You're the chosen of God, and God has put you in this place. Now, a lot of times, I think also... Uh, we grow up watching these demonic movies and we see these ghost movies or whatever and we think that's the demonic realm. No, it's not. These are just fallen angels and the way they depict it in the movies, yes, sometimes they manifest themselves in real ways, which can be kind of, you know, interesting, but it's not like they show it in the movies and oftentimes I think they give the demonic realm a lot more uh, glamorous approach or look, if you can use that word, than, than is really deserving and because of that, it creates this fear that's in the heart. But it's like anything else we're afraid of, once we understand it, once we know we've been given authority over them through Jesus. We know how to fight and we simply pray against them in the name of Jesus. And if they physically manifest, I don't mean you're seeing demons, but if you run across someone demonically possessed and you suspect they're demonically possessed, then you can rebuke that in the name of Jesus. Now, again, a lot of times we see these guys on TV, on the Christian TV, and um, they'll sit and have this long conversation with Satan. You know, I told Satan this and I told the demons that you don't need to sit down and have tea and crumpets with the enemy. Okay. You're going to see that when Jesus dealt with the demonic realm in the Bible, it was very short, it was very quick, it was very to the point. It was be quiet and get out of here. That pretty much was the extent of the conversation the Lord had with him. Sometimes, what is your name? And really speaking to the man, we'll see today, what is your name? But the demons interrupted because there were so many and they took over. The man couldn't even say his own name. But I just say that to let you know, you don't need to be talking to the enemy, long drawn out conversations. But it is okay to say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, or I command you to leave. There's nothing wrong in that. We see Jesus as our example. Now, when we saw Michael the archangel dealing with Satan, remember, they were fighting over the body of Moses. Well, actually, Michael was protecting it. Satan wanted his body. And so for probably a number of reasons we don't have time to get into, Michael said to him, the Lord rebuke you. And that's a great thing to say to the enemy, the Lord rebuke you. Uh, Again, it's it's through his authority and his power that we rebuke the enemy. I don't know that it's necessarily wrong to say, I rebuke you, as long as we know that it's really we're the Lord's representative. We're not the one that really walks in that authority to rebuke. It is Jesus that has the authority. He gives us the authority, and we can say, in the name of Jesus, you have to go. And so you can command the demonic realm to do that, and there's nothing wrong in doing that. You just want to make sure you don't get into these conversations and all this weird stuff that oftentimes we see um, on Christian TV. That is not biblical, and that is not wise. By the way, you want to, why would you want to talk to the enemy anyway? He's going to lie to you, deceive you, try to make you afraid. You know, I'd rather talk to the Lord, you know, and just kind of keep it there um, and go from that route. But there is a place, I do believe, where a verbal rebuke of the enemy in rare settings uh, may actually be appropriate. And if that ever happens, God will lead you in that, and God will instruct you in that and show you at the time. So what's the setting is where we are. Now remember the setting. The day started out with Jesus battling the demonic realm from the onset. He went to the synagogue. A demon cried out. He rebuked a demon. A demon. They're at church, if you will, Sunday morning, but Saturday morning for them. You get the point, the analogy. He goes home. He has lunch. All these demons begin to show up. Well, people bring the people that are demon possessed. He begins rebuking the demons. Remember we talked about rebuking um, uh, Peter's mother-in-law's uh, fever, and he speaks to it as though it's a person. We believe there's a, a demonic representative. I believe there's a demonic representation behind that. The 
world was rebuking. And we know the enemy can't affect us uh, physically. Um, and, and at the same time, we also see now that he gets into this boat, remember, and he starts crossing over the Sea of Galilee. It's about seven miles across. And as they get out there, this terrible storm whips up. And remember what's happening. The Lord has just rebuked the demons on this side. The Lord is heading to the other side to set these two demoniacs free that we're gonna be looking at in chapter eight today. Don't you think the demons recognize what was going on? I can imagine the demons on the other side going, he's coming for us. The boat's coming straight our way. And they begin to bring a spiritual opposition to the Lord. And remember we saw in the book of Job that Satan can affect the weather to a certain degree. And then there's this storm that whips up. I believe it was a demonic storm because Jesus, when he rebukes the storm, he rebukes it using language of speaking to a person. Not language correcting nature or making a change to the environment. He speaks the same words of rebuke that he did to Satan in the wilderness and the demonic realm when he deals with them. So most scholars believe, and I agree with them, although I'm no scholar, he was rebuking the demonic realm. And so again, we see the storm die down as the demonic realm was rebuked. No doubt them stirring things up quite literally because they saw them coming to set these guys free. And they didn't want to set them free because the demons wanted to stay in these two men. One of the things we're going to see about the demonic realm as we get more into this is that they don't like to be unembodied. They want to be inhabiting someone. Now, as a believer, they cannot inhabit you because you have the light of God. And you can be oppressed but not possessed, as we said. The unbeliever, they can inhabit, but a door has to be open for that. And so these men apparently had opened some door to the demonic realm. The demonic realm found an inn, and once they found an inn, they just kept moving in. And we're going to see that it might be as many as over 6,000 inhabiting these two men. Now, we don't know that for sure, but I'll tell you why we know that it certainly was thousands a little bit later. And, why, and, 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 and no doubt, uh, whether it was split up evenly, we don't know. These demons are having a fit knowing that Jesus is coming to set them free, and they're throwing everything they can at the Lord, working in conjunction with Satan and the limited powers that he has to stop them. And so that's the setting of what's going on in this whole um, uh, demonic thing set up here in this, this uh, battle that's about to take place. Now, we're going to see it's not much of a battle because the Lord is going to say, you know, be gone. It's interesting to imagine that maybe some of the demons that the Lord just cast out on the other side may have come across the lake and gone inside these two guys. We don't know that. But again, it says that when a demon leaves where they are, they look for someone else they can possess, another unbeliever that's opened the door. This guy was nearby. They may have just gone straight into him. By the way, what are some ways that unbelievers can open doors to the demonic realm? Drugs and alcohol. That's one of the ways the door can be opened. Matter of fact, you see, when you see a lot of the um, Indian religions out west, and uh, they'll use peyote, and they'll have these things where they say their spirit guides come to them. And when you hear what's happening, this is more than just some type of a drug-induced trip. These beings are speaking to them and telling them things that are very spiritual and oftentimes theological. So these are real beings that are coming and speaking to these people. And so there's this door that you open up, but you have to make sure that door is closed. And I believe, again, for uh, it could be something spiritual that's not of God. It could be drugs and alcohol. It could be all kinds of things. I think when you see believers oftentimes that begin to get oppressed, it doesn't mean that you're doing something wrong. It could just be God allowing the enemy to mess with you, to grow you in some way. But again, I spoke with someone just recently that was walking with the Lord and they veered off into some things that is definitely an open door to the demonic realm. And I know that after all these years of ministry because I've seen a real connection there. And they said the moment they began to do that, they began to get messed with demonically. And they came for prayer. And the thing was, all right, have you turned away from that? Yes, okay, have you seen it stop? Yes, there's your problem. Don't open any more doors. You can't be possessed, but if you open a door, even as a believer to the enemy, to let him come into your home, to let him come into your life, into your family, you're gonna see some demonic activity. And so the thing is, is to find out what it is from God and deal with it, uh, repent of it and turn from it. And so Jesus now, uh, again, is going to go and deliver these men. And I find this really sweet, and I'll tell you why. You think about these two men. These are just two men. And the reason I find this so sweet of the Lord is this place where they are is in the middle of nowhere. There's a village back a little bit farther away from it, but right where they are, next to the Sea of Galilee, where those tombs were, there's nothing there. How do I know that? I've been there. I've been there numerous times. When we go there to Israel, we drive around that area and we know exactly where the demoniac thing happened because I begin to foam with the mouth. No, I'm just kidding. Right when we get to that place, the Bible tells us in Mark, there's a steep place that runs right down into the water. It's the only place on the Sea of Galilee that does that. 
So it tells us in Mark that's where it happened. We can literally pinpoint the place where this took place. And it's a very short area right there from the tombs down to the water. It's out in the middle of nowhere. But what I love about that is it shows that Jesus said, I don't care who you are. I don't care how, how, how demonically possessed or oppressed. I don't care how lonely you feel. I don't care if you think no one cares. If I hear anything at all that you want me, I'm coming after you. And I think that's what happened. I think about all the voices of the thousands of demons, as we'll see in a moment, that were inside of these men. And yet somewhere in there was the tiny voice of a person that was so overwhelmed by the demonic realm and so taken into darkness that all they could probably say is, help, Lord, help. That's all they could say, no doubt. And we don't know for sure if that was the case. But I don't believe that the Lord would have made that special trip to set them free if he knew they didn't want to be set free. And I believe that voice cried out from them and the Lord went after them. What's my point? My point is this. If you feel oppressed this morning, if you feel beaten down by the enemy, if you feel overwhelmed by the voices in your head, it may not be demonic, but just all the, the, the turmoil going on in the world and in your life and in your family and in your work and all these decisions and emotions, the Lord hears you when you cry out. If all you can say is, Lord, help. It may not be some long drawn out prayer, you know, following some acronym and all the water, just Lord, help. He hears your voice and he will travel through the storm to calm the storm, to command that you be set free if you simply cry out with your heart this morning. God has that for you. And I love that he did this for these demoniacs. Jesus heard them and he went to them and Jesus hears you this morning and he comes to you. Well, let's jump right into the passage. Again, we just finished the storm. Long day, long night, probably that next morning when they're arriving. Verse 28, and when he had come to the other side of the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that no one could pass by that way. Now, several things to note here. The Gergesenes, also known as the Gadarenes, again, this was an area on the east side of the Sea of Galilee, predominantly Gentile, but probably had a Jewish presence. Most believe there was a, a noticeable Jewish presence, probably in this time. Uh, this is one of the cities in the area of the Decapolis, uh, meaning the number 10, the capitalists uh, the, uh, uh, from decade, there were 10 regions of Gentile cities that were around the Sea of Galilee. This was in that region. And so many believe that not only what did it have the Gentiles there, but because it was, of course, in Israel and a highly populated Jewish area around the Sea of Galilee, that many Jews were there as well. As a matter of fact, some postulate that maybe these were even Jewish farms that had the pigs. Now, again, if indeed that was the case, no wonder Jesus allowed the pigs later to be destroyed because this was direct rebellion to the Lord that they were doing by raising these unclean animals. Now, again, as you know, pigs are not unclean now. I'm thankful for the verse that says, rise, Peter, kill and eat, or put your own name in there. Rise, Mark, kill and eat, one of my favorite verses. As a matter of fact, a week from now, there'll be some pulled pork. None of these, I promise you, but you're gonna have some pork there in the cafe and that's okay, there's no problem. But at this time, it was still forbidden by the Lord to have a symbolism as well as health reasons. You know, again, we have a lot more uh, wisdom now in science, knowing what's good and bad. They didn't have that then. So God had to teach them supernaturally what to stay away from because they didn't know that if you didn't put, cook the pork good enough, all uh, these kind of things could happen or whatever the case might be. Um, but either way, these were unclean animals. Um, and so these men here, again, in the, in the area of the Gadarenes, they met him, two demon-possessed men. Now, again, Mark gives us, I'm going, I'll, I'll be sharing more out of Mark because it fills the picture. And if you want to read that later, it's Mark chapter five. But it says here, the first thing about these two demon-possessed men, they ran down to meet the Lord um, exceedingly fierce. What would that be? I mean, these guys, everybody was afraid of these guys. They were terrorizing the region. Uh, we'll get more details about them in a moment, but they run down to meet him. Uh, the Bible tells us these guys were so fierce, they'd been breaking the chains, Mark tells us. They tried to chain them up, and these guys were breaking chains off of themselves and the shackles off of themselves. How in the world could they do this? Well, supernatural strength. Now, I don't know exactly how much supernatural strength you receive from the enemy if you're demon-possessed, but a lot of it is not really supernatural strength, and it might not even be supernatural strength at all. A lot of it might simply be the demonic realm doesn't care about your body. And if they're inside a body and it's got chains, they don't care to rip the skin and rip the body and tear it apart and do whatever they have to do to it, to break the bones, to do, they don't care. So you'll see when you some, someone demon possessed will be violent, they'll throw a body around like it doesn't matter, like we would never do with our body because it hurts and we want to protect it but they'll throw the body around in a more aggressive, more violent way. So there might be some supernatural thing to strength there. A lot of it, I think, is simply because of the way that uh, they don't care whether or not they hurt the body or not. But these guys were exceedingly fierce, notice it says, these demon-possessed men. 
And, and the, that has, again, the, it's interesting, the adjective, exceedingly. We don't know what that means exactly, except they were exceedingly fierce. And so much so, you couldn't even pass by that area. It says no one could pass by there. And again, if you ever get to drive around the Sea of Galilee, you'll see that there's not a large area between the Golan Heights and the, and the water. And so there wasn't a large area. So people traveling, it would have been a great nuisance to go around them. You've had to make quite effort, quite of an effort to get around them, if you will. And so these guys were a lot of trouble in a lot of ways. And um, they're, they're exceedingly fierce. No one could even pass by that way. And notice, and suddenly they cried out saying, <clears throat> what have we to do with you, son of God? Have you come to torment us before the time? Now, it's interesting to note here that Mark tells us when the demons saw Jesus, they ran and worshiped him. Isn't that interesting? They ran and worshiped the Lord. You find that in Mark chapter five. We don't get all the details here. But I find that interesting because we know the demonic realm hates Jesus. We know the demons hated him, and yet they had to bow down before him and worship him. Isn't that interesting? Why do I, why do I say that? Because the Bible says this in Romans 14, verses 11 and 12. It says, for it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God so that each of us shall give account of himself to God. That is all of creation, all of mankind at some point on judgment day, even the demonic realm will bow before the Lord and give him glory regardless of whether they hate him or love him. Every knee will bow, whether it's a demon or a person that just hates the Lord, or us that are willingly bowing because we love him. Even these demons had to fall down and bow before the Lord. How shocking this must have been to the disciples. I was trying to picture this in my mind. They come in after a long night. They think they're gonna die. It's been a terrible storm. You know, the wind's blowing. Lord, we're gonna die. Then it dies down and thinking, okay, well, that's great. We're not gonna die, but now we have to row. You know, I mean, <laughs> grab your oars. We gotta get on into the bank, you know, type thing. Somebody was sharing that with me last week saying, you know, sometimes we pray to get out of the storm. That might be the very thing blowing us to shore, you know, and we ask to get out of it. Now we've got to work a lot harder in our flesh to get where God wanted us to be to begin with. But either way, now they get to the other side. They're exhausted. They're tired. They get out of the boat. I pictured, you know, myself in the boat with them. What would that have been like? You jump out in the water. You pull the boat up. Jesus gets out of the boat. And all of a sudden, these two Tasmanian devils start running down the hill. You're spinning or whatever. And dirt's flying everywhere. You're like, ah! You know, I'm wanting to stand by the boat or get back in the boat, right? And I just picture these guys kind of freezing, going, oh! You know, and the Lord just walks forward and takes control. Isn't it great? These demons just whoop. They fall down before him and begin to beg for mercy. And the Lord, again, is not gonna have a lot of mercy on the demons, but his heart was really for the mercy on the two men who are being tormented by the demons. But notice the theological understanding these demons have. These demons actually have more theological understanding than a lot of people even in churches today. And why is that? Because they've lived it. They know it. They're part of it. Look at what they say. This is interesting to me. They cried out, what? Do we have to do with you, Jesus? Number one, they obviously believe in Jesus and know he's real because they cry out to him and acknowledge him. That's the demonic realm. There are people today that don't acknowledge that Jesus is real. But the demonic realm knows it. You know why? Because number one, he created them when they were angels before they were kicked out. And number two, they have to deal with him. And they fear him. And so their theology, they recognize Jesus is who he says he is. Number one, they say you, number two rather, you're the son of God. How many people today don't recognize that Jesus is God in human form? Sad, some of the statistics say that even pastors today don't believe that Jesus is God. The demons oftentimes believe more than some of the people in America's pulpits. Is that sad or what? And then lastly, notice the last thing here. Have you come here to torment us before the time? They very much believe in a judgment day. And there's a lot of people in churches today who do not believe in a judgment day. Listen, if you're here today and you don't believe that one day you're gonna stand before God and be judged, the demons know more than you do. That's not a good place to be. You need to find out what you're gonna do with that and how you're gonna deal with that so you can be ready. They know their day is coming. Do we know ours is? And again, if we're believers in the Lord, we know that our day is not gonna be um, anything other than a day of rejoicing but it's not gonna be so for the unbeliever. Now, it's also interesting when Jesus met with the demons in the past, because they're gonna say, Lord, notice this, they say, Lord, don't torment us. Uh, they cried out saying, whatever you do with you, don't torment us before the time. They knew they had torment in their future. Now, certainly they know about the lake of fire, which is what we call hell, but there's another torment the demons are gonna face prior to hell. It's a place the Bible calls the bottomless pit. Oftentimes you'll see the demons say, don't cast us into the pit before our time or Lord, don't torment us. When you read the Old Testament, and I know you're reading your Old Testament. 
you're going to see that it talks about the pit quite often. It describes in Revelation what the pit is. It's the bottomless pit in the center of the earth. And why is it referred to as bottomless? Again, because the earth is round. There's no bottom to a round surface or to a round a sphere, if you will. And there in the middle of it, we see that in, in, in throughout the scripture. And so there's this holding tank. We look at it this way. It's like a bunch of criminals being held in the holding tank before they go to the judge. And the demons know they're going to be there. When Jesus comes back for a thousand years, the Bible says he's going to grab Satan and the demonic realm and throw them into the bottomless pit. They'll be in the heart of the earth. We're going to be held there for a thousand years while we're here on the earth having a blast with the Lord. They'll be called out later to be judged. And that's a whole different story. I encourage you to listen to Revelation if you hadn't heard it. But the reality is there are some demons that are already in the pit. How do we know that? The Bible says there were some demons, some of the fallen angels that did something so bad back during the days of Noah that God locked them up early and put them in the center of the earth. Uh, Peter talks about this in 2 Peter. So they're locked up in a place called Tartarus. It's the only time the word is ever used in the Bible, but it describes where these fallen angels are. You can look that up on your own later. But what's wild about that is the, the, the demons are saying, we don't want to go there. We know that our brothers have already been locked up in there. We don't want to go there before we have to. Let us stay out until we have to get locked up during the thousand year you know, kingdom. Give us as much time as we have. What's wild about that is the Bible says that during the great tribulation, that God's going to open that pit up where these demons are being held. And the Bible says a hole will open somewhere in the earth, billowing smoke from the heat and the fire from the center of the earth that we know is there scientifically will come billowing out. These demons will be released. And by the way, this is after the rapture. Aren't you glad you know Jesus? They're going to come out of the earth. And the Bible says they'll be stinging mankind with some type of sting, whether it be spiritual or real. It's going to be a physical effect that's going to last for five months. And they're going to wish to die and not be able to. So these guys are bad dudes. All right. They're saying, we don't want to go down there where they're locked up. Isn't it interesting? Jesus said, the last days is going to be just like the day, are going to be just like the days of Noah. And it's going to be just like the days of Noah. Violence will fill the earth and the demonic realm will once again be released to do a lot of things on the earth that I'm glad I'm not going to be here for when they do it. And so now you see what's happening here when they're saying, we don't want to go there. We don't want to be locked up in that dark, hot, horrible place until we're there only to be let out for a short amount of time during the great tribulation, then to be locked right back up for a thousand years, then to come out after a thousand years and be thrown into the lake of fire. That is not a good future for the demonic realm. <laughs> you know, again, I say, I'll tell you, don't talk to the demonic realm very much, but you probably all heard this a short years ago. You should say, look, when Satan reminds you uh, of your past, remind him of his future. I mean, it's not something he wants to think about. And yet it's something they have to face and they don't want to face it now. Lord, do not deal with us before the time. And notice now a good way off from them, there was a herd of many swine feeding. So the, again, Mark tells us it was 2,000. 2,000 pigs, all right? Now, this room has a little under 600 chairs. So picture this room and add 400 chairs to it. Now double it. That's how many pigs were on the hillside. This was no small herd of animals. So you can imagine what an event this would have been when these guys come running down the mountainside, the thunder, the sound. It wouldn't have been like horses or like, you know, cattle, but it would have been quite the rumble. It would have been, you know, they say when pigs fly. Well, this wouldn't be pigs flying, but they'd be flying down the mountain, so to speak, making quite the noise and splashing into the water. We're going to see, and they all, later on we'll find they drowned, if you will, but this would have been a big event that took place. And it says, so the demons begged him. Notice they're begging, saying, if you cast us out, permit us to go away into the herd of swine. Now, a couple of things I want you to note here. It says they begged. Mark tells us all of them begged. Now, why is that important? Again, in Mark, it also tells us when the Lord says, what is your name? And it would appear the Lord is asking the man, what is your name? But the demons answer, overwhelming the man. And you could argue back and forth theologically who he's speaking to. I think he was speaking to the man. But the demons answer, we're legion. A legion was over 6,000 Roman soldiers. Now, that doesn't mean it was a complete 6,000. It could have been, you know, five, four, three, two, one, whatever. Who knows? Uh, but the point is, there's a lot of us in here. How they were divided up between the men, we don't know. We know that 2,000 pigs are going to get possessed and run down the hill in just a moment. 
But the reality is, they're all begging. What was that like? Now, for Hollywood, we'd, we'd make quite the scene. 6,000 voices, or 3,000, maybe 3,000 in him, 3,000 in him, crying out, using that man's voice and that man's voice, and, and whatever guttural sound as they're all speaking at the same time. It's like, everybody stop talking at once, you know? But they're all begging him, it says, let us go in the, in the swine, let us go in the pigs. And this cry's coming out, that no doubt was a horrific cry coming out of this man. I doubt it was amplified and had reverb and multiple things the way Hollywood would do it, but it still probably wasn't pretty. And they said, if you cast us out, notice this, permit us. Here's what I want you to note. Demons can't do anything without permission. Angels are not free to do what they want. They can't mess with you. They can't possess anyone. They can't do anything God doesn't allow them to do. So take comfort in that. The Lord is our protector. But they ask for permission. Even in Job, we see they had to ask permission to mess with Job. They say, permit us to go away into the herd of swine. And again, I, I, I find this interesting for a couple of reasons. Number one, the need for permission here to go into the pigs. As we said, we saw there in Job, the fact that all of them are speaking at once. But look what they want to do. They want to go into the swine. That is, they would rather go into an animal than to be unembodied. Isn't that amazing? Now, I don't know that God always allows animals to be possessed, or if it's only pigs that can be possessed, or never again will any other animal be possessed, but they would rather be in an animal than just be roaming free. It must be torment without a body. We're just a soul that has a body around it, right? A spirit. But again, they'd rather be in an animal than be out of an animal, and what's amazing to me, at least with pigs here, God allowed them to temporarily go inside of an animal. Now you know what's wrong with your cat. <laughs> I see that hand. I'm joking. I really do like cats. I say that all the time. They're easy to pick on, but I, I like cats. I think we had a demon-possessed squirrel for a while. I don't know if Tolly's in. Oh, she says no, but I think he was. He, you get near him, ta -ta -ta, he would dive on you and like attack you. So either way... But I don't know if animals can be demon-possessed now or not. But the reality is, it just shows you a demon would, be rather, would rather be in something living than to be outside of that. We see this Jesus speaking about casting out demons, said they wander around hoping they can come back to the place where, where, where they left if they can. Luke eleven twenty four. 24, notice what it says. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places. They don't like it for whatever dry is to them. Look, seeking rest. They're not at rest when they're we're not embodying in someone. For finding none, he says, I will return to my house which I came from. That is the person I was cast out of. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order, you know, cleaned out by the Lord. He goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Here's the point. If you're ever involved in a situation where you pray for someone to be free from the demonic realm, if they're an unbeliever, you need to give them the gospel right afterwards. Because you don't want to leave an empty house. It may be swept in in order now. Great, I'm glad you're free. I'm glad you have peace and all that. But you know what? I'm going to share some of you. You need Jesus Christ because if you don't fill that void with the Lord, they're going to come back. And they're going to bring buddies with them. And if it wasn't bad enough, you're not going to like the way it is afterwards. It's going to be worse than before. So if you ever find yourself, not that you would, but if you ever do, you want to make sure that you pray for that person and give them the gospel so that they can receive the Lord. And we're going to see this man again does receive the Lord and is in a place of peace and rest when God sets him free. Again, as we said, uh, it, you know, uh, tells us in Mark, again, these demons, all of them crying out, huge numbers of demons competing for uh, the, the, the vocal cords, if you will. Lord, let us go in the swine. And notice he said to them, not, it wasn't a long conversation. I love this, go. <laughs> I'll let you do that. I'll permit that, go. But he knew it'd be a short-lived possession, right? He says, go. And so when they had come out of him, they went into the herd of swine and suddenly the entire herd of swine ran violently down the steep place into the sea and they perished in the water. Now try to imagine this. I was imagining, what if you're one of the farmers up there? Again, you're standing up there and you're with all the pigs and you're watching 2,000 pigs and you see this boat coming to shore in the morning. They're coming in and you're thinking, oh man, all the guys talking, look at these guys. Some guys, go, he's going right down where the demon possessed guys are. Should we warn him? You know, you wonder if they're going, you know, I don't know. And all of a sudden the boat pulls up ashore and they're probably watching with intensity and the guys kind of hop out in the water and then they see you know, some of the guys hop back in, you know, whatever the case might be, as these guys come you know, running down the hill toward Jesus. And they're thinking, man, this guy's in big trouble. Some guy steps up by himself. They're gonna jump right on top of him. What's he thinking? And they get to him and they drop and begin to worship. They've gotta be thinking, who is this? What kind of authority and power does, well, who is that guy? And you wonder, could they hear, they no doubt could hear them speaking. Sound travels great over there. But I wonder, 
Could they make out the words? I don't know. It's almost more comical, if there is anything comical about it, if they couldn't make out the words, because all of a sudden they're standing there going, let's see what's going to happen. Listen, you know when those demons came out and went into those pigs, those pigs are just like, you know, they're minding their business. You might think about it, right? And all of a sudden, blah! I mean, can you imagine? They probably all just went, poof! and tensed up and jumped, and then rah, they take off running down. These guys watching them had to be going, ah, dodging pigs, you know, and doing, who knows what was happening. And they watch them all run down to the water and whoosh, right in the water, and, and they just, you know, they drown. Now try to imagine this as well. 2,000 pigs, it's not gonna be long until they bloat and float. <laughs> They'd be floating all over the Sea of Galilee. Coming up on the shore, stinky, flies everywhere. I mean, this would have been a nasty scene. And this is all from that farm that was there on the hillside. You know, again, you just try to imagine what's taking place. This would have been rather dramatic to watch this take place uh, when it happened. But again, when, uh, you know, they went into the herd of swine, they ran down from the steep place, they perished in the water. And it says, and those who kept them fled. You know, these guys that saw this happen, they're now running back into town going, hey, you're not gonna believe what happened. Um, I gotta tell you some bad news about your pigs. Uh, first of all, the demon-possessed guys, they seem to be normal now. Some guy showed up and said something, and they're acting normal. They're not, they talk to him, and they're one sitting down, they're, they're in their right mind. Here's the bad news. All your pigs ran down, they just ran into the water, and they all drowned. It's like, What? What, what happened? I don't know. We're just standing there and boom, here they all go. And look, I'm lucky to be alive. I'm just telling you what happened, whatever. And they go and they can, he's going to come back out and find out what happened. Look what it says here. It says, they went to the city, told everything that had happened uh, to the demon-possessed men. And obviously the pigs were going to see. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus. Again, you can imagine the fervor. Let's go see this guy. What happened? Who is he? And when they saw him, they, look at this, they begged him to depart from their region. Amazing. When you read Mark, it says the demons were begging to stay in the region. We don't have that detail here in Matthew, but it says, please don't cast us out of the region for whatever. They want to stay in that area of darkness. Now, these guys are saying to Jesus, we want you to get out of here. This is amazing to me. One of the most shocking responses and of this the verse of this whole passage, the people of Gadara, rather than asking Jesus to stay and saying, look, thank you for what you did for these men. Would you stay and now speak to us in the village and give us some hope, show us what we're supposed to do. Instead, they beg him to depart from their region. That amazes me. But just as amazing is he did it. It tells us in Mark, he got back in the boat and went to the other side. And I'll get that, Lord, you know they needed help. That was a demon-influenced area. There were demons everywhere. Now those demons are still there somewhere. They don't want to leave that area. They're not in the pigs. They're not in the men. They're still around there somewhere. Don't they need you more than ever? And of course, they did need, need him. The Lord knew they needed him. But guys, note this. Jesus will never force himself on anyone. He will come to you this morning. And he will say, I will set you free. Whether it's a demon possession, whether it's a demon oppression, whether it's just whatever the case might be, he'll set you free. But if you say, no, no, thank you. I'm glad that worked for you, but I don't want that. I'm glad the religion thing, I don't want that. He's not gonna make, he's not gonna force himself. He's gonna go to the other side. He's gonna leave you alone. He's very much a gentleman. And here's why. Not only, he honors your choice, number one, but number two, love demands a choice. Forced love is not love. And so the fact that he says, no, I want to know you want me and I want to know you love me. I'm not gonna make you do anything, but know that I'm here for you. The same thing is true for everybody in this room this morning. He loves you, he wants you to be his own, but you've gotta make the choice. And if you say no, he'll respect that and he'll leave you alone. But that's a foolish choice to make. It's a foolish choice to make because it leaves you with the pigs and the demons for the rest of eternity. And again, uh, he'll respect your choice um, another gospel tells us, again, what, another reason they, they, they ask him to leave. Why would they ask him to leave? One is, again, I think probably one of the main reasons is because, again, the Bible says they, 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 they were afraid. You know, such A man with such power no doubt brought conviction because there they were raising pigs, and especially if they were Jews and raising pigs, here's this great rabbi casting out demons, and again, they're going, whoa, now you obviously see that I'm not living the way I should be living. There's conviction of sin here. But also, secondly, they were bad for business. Jesus was bad for business. It's like, you know, I don't want to get too much of this Jesus stuff in there because look what he did. He took my entire pig farm and they ran down the hill. Look at the value they lost. A great value was lost. I don't know what 2,000 pigs would cost, but I imagine the cost of buying a farm of 2,000 pigs would be you know, similar to what it would have been in that day, not in the same money value, but in the same value of the day. And so these men lost a lot of money or whoever owned this lost a lot of money. It affected their pocketbook. Uh, but lastly, this is interesting to me. I don't want you to miss the fact this demon-infested area cared more about the pigs or the animals than they did the people. We see what you did for this man by setting him free. We know what you could do for our village, but 
This is our income. This, we really would rather not have you here. We, we care more about the animals than we care about you. And guys, is that not true today? Listen, one of the markers of a demon-infested area is when animals and God's creation is more important than people. I love my doxy. I kiss her all the time. But you're worth a lot more than a dachshund. You are created in the image of God. Animals were not created in the image of God. The earth was created so those of you that live in the image of God could live on the earth. And, and, and so when you see a demonically influenced mindset, you'll see it shift from the importance of people to the importance of animals. Look at abortion today. Pouring millions in, into abortion, pouring billions into the environment and watching people around the world just perish and go without. The focus is wrong. And that is a demonically influenced focus. As believers, we have to have a spiritually, a godly influence focus and realize that it's people that God loves. He didn't die on the cross for the environment. He didn't die on the cross for animals. He loves them. He created them. As a matter of fact, the Bible says the righteous are good to their animals. But he died for you on the cross. He died for mankind. He laid down his life for you so that when he destroys this earth, and he's going to very soon, he could give you a brand new heaven, new earth, and you would live with him forever as his bride. See, that's the importance. That's where the focus needs to be. Again, it's interesting that, uh, again, Jesus did leave, but Mark tells us that he said to the demoniac that was delivered, go back into the town. No doubt he told them both, go back and be a witness. And guys, note this. If you've been set free by the Lord, God's calling you to be a witness to those around you. No matter how demonically influenced your atmosphere is that you came out of, he's calling you to be a witness. Pray for boldness. Be a witness. God wants you to go back. They see what God has done for you. They see how your life has changed. And so they're going to use, God will use you to be a witness to them. So even though Jesus left and didn't force himself on them, he left a witness because he loved them. And he sent them right into the midst saying, all right, they don't want me, but you go in there and live it out. Let them see what I have to offer as I live through your life. And then they'll have a desire for me. Some of them will, and they'll be drawn in. But the last thing this morning I want you to note before we wrap this up is notice it says here, they were in the area of Gadara. If you remember anything about when God brought the children of Israel from Egypt into the promised land. Remember he said, I'm taking you out of a place of, of, of horridness into a whole new life of milk and honey, a life of blessing, a land that is rich and full. I'm gonna bless you so much in that land. And when they got to the land, 10 of the tribes went right on in. But two of the tribes, and actually technically two and a half of the tribes said, you know what, um, I know all those promises are in the land that God said and going in fully in and the fullness of the land, but we kind of like it right here. We'll, we'll just, can, can we just kind of settle for this? I mean, this is good enough for us. I, I, I know the promise is greater if you fully enter in, but this is, we kind of like this. It's good enough for us. Listen, don't be that Christian. Don't be the Christian where you are right now that says, you know what, I, I, I know that if I fully devoted myself to God, I realized there'd be blessings. I would hear more in the spiritual realm. God would speak to me more. My life would be fuller. I mean, I hear people say that, so I kind of understand that. That probably would happen. I'm happy right here. I kind of have this kind of place that I'm comfortable in. I don't want to go all in for the Lord. I can go to church. I can say praise the Lord. I can use the language, go to a couple of potlucks, do whatever. But I don't want to get really serious about this thing. So I'm just comfortable right here. Listen, they settled in that part of the land and it ended up being an area that was full of pigs and demonic possession. The problem is when you settle for less than the fullness that God has for you, you're dwelling in the outer skirts of God's people and there's more demonic activity and you'll never come into the fullness of the Lord that God has for your life. Here's my appeal to you. By the way, for the children of Israel that stayed there, whenever they were attacked by their armies, guess who the first ones to fall was? It was them. They were on the outskirts. The armies came to them first and God had put a barrier of the Jordan River between them and the armies, but they chose to settle on this side and they were always the first ones wiped out and then the others could kind of regroup and battle against the enemy. If you're on the outskirts, if you're settling for less than what God has for you and you're not fully joining in, you're gonna see that you're gonna be the first ones to be wiped out. You know, I don't see people that are walking close to the Lord falling, but I see people that are dabbling on the outskirts falling on a regular basis and it keeps me sober. I don't want to be there. And if you're on the outskirts this morning, if you're in an area that you know has some demonic influence, if you've not fully entered into the promised land that God has given you under the protection of the shepherd, that is the Lord Jesus being over you, you need to enter in fully this morning. And I want to pray that we'll have that heart, that you will do that. I'm thankful we now know more of how to recognize the demonic realm. I'm thankful we now know more how to deal with the demonic realm. But more than that, we need to know how to walk close with Jesus Christ. 
Because when we do that, he defeats everything for us. He is our victory. So let's pray that we'll have that kind of heart. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, God, for what you've taught us about recognizing the demonic realm and dealing with the demonic realm and seeing your love and your faithfulness in the midst of all of it. But Lord, if there are any here this morning that haven't entered fully in to the promised land, they've not gone completely in, Lord, to everything you promised, and they've been, Lord, fine just to kind of settle on the outskirts. This is good enough. Lord, it's not good enough. Not if they want to be free. Not if they want to walk in power. Not if they want to be totally protected by the good shepherd and enjoy the fullness of the blessing that you offer. Lord, I pray you'd stir any hearts that are there this morning. And if that's you this morning and you're saying, look, I, want, I don't want to settle anymore. I want everything given to the Lord. Tell him right now, I'll give you my whole heart, my whole being, nothing left behind. I don't want to be on the outskirts. I'm pressing in. I want to be right in the middle of the action. Lord, for all those that are praying, I know you hear them right now. And, and I thank you for hearing those prayers, God, and working in their hearts. I pray you pour out your spirit on them. And Lord, if there's any here this morning that just have been crying out from the oppression of the enemy, and they're wondering, do you hear them at all? God, even as you heard that small little voice drowned it out by thousands of demonic voices, you heard and you, you weathered the storm and made the effort in fatigue as a man to go and set them free. How much more as the God of all the universe will you meet them right now in this room if they simply ask? And I encourage you, if that's you, to ask. And at the same time, Lord, if there's any here that don't know you, they've never made that commitment, and for the first time their eyes have been opened, they wouldn't walk out of this place until they acknowledge that you died for them on the cross, that they believe, Lord, your blood paid for their sin. And if that's you, ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin. Tell him you believe he died for your sins and receive him as your Lord and Savior. Father, we thank you for the work of your spirit this morning. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.